Uh, the session is entitled Media Old and New. And let me introduce the panelists first. So from the right side, uh, Mr. Peter Wilson, co-founder and managing director of G Plus Media. Okay. And Mr. Ross Raberry, president and representative director of Ida Oman Japan. And Professor Jun Murai, Dean and Professor at Faculty of Environment and Information Studies, Keio University. And Mr. Nick Garwin, main presenter, BBC World News. And this session's moderator is Mr. Masa Akira James Kanda, country manager of Twitter Japan. Okay, uh, so let me uh, get started. Uh, the topic is uh, media, old and new, and we have uh, great guests uh, and panelists to talk about it today. Uh, I think what I'd like to, to start off with uh, is uh, a question about the topic, uh, media, old and new. Uh, I think uh, I, come, I work at Twitter, uh, and uh, the interesting conversation I had a couple of minutes ago with Nick was uh, Twitter is becoming an old media. You know, it's a very challenging uh, way to introduce ourselves. I was sort of taken aback. But, um, but I think uh, a lot of people assume that there is old media and new media. So before we dive right in, I just want to go quickly around the sort of floor uh, asking about whether that distinction is there, what's old media, new media, how should we think about it, before we dive in to a specific topic about the relevance uh, for Japan around 311 and the world. Nick, can you get us started? I don't think they. I don't. I don't think that there should be. Uh, is this working? Mm. Yeah. I have this problem every day. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think there should be a distinction between old and new media. Uh, old media is media which isn't going to survive much longer. New media is old media which can be then uh, adapted, monetized, and made available on this digital form and probably is moving towards, certainly when it comes to the printed press, is moving towards the, the point where there will be no more printing presses and it's gonna be hastened by the recession which is making life even more difficult when it comes to shipping and everything else. I work essentially in the traditional media, but if we don't modernize, and which we're doing, and have multiple platforms using digital content, digital content is the critical nature of, of the way the media is gonna survive, be monetized, and be able to pay for itself, including paying for things called journalists, people called journalists like me, who still expect a salary, and we've got to provide value added. It doesn't mean to say we're old, and old doesn't, isn't reflected in the color of our hair. It's about someone of my generation who remembers film, understanding the way people want to consume their media now, and being extremely agile and nimble about it. I can still read newspapers on this, and journalists are still being paid to produce what appears. That is the exciting part of this new media environment we're working in. Okay, okay yeah, I, I basically agree with, uh, you know, the, there, there should be a no distinction between the new and old. But uh, there is a one, uh, you know, especially from the experiences of the, the earthquake and the right after that, probably the most famous uh, impact was the Twitter, you know, yours. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so the, the, in, a, in a probably the 60 minutes right after the earthquake, then you know, there is a tremendous amount of the Twitter messages uh, going, starting from Japan and going around the world, retweeted and uh, you know, everything. So uh, there is a nice uh, movies on that, right, um, impact. And now, uh, that was uh, basically Twitter is a broadcast, right? Because if you tweet, and then everybody in the world would do it here. So this is a global broadcast media. So, uh, uh, so uh, nobody, I mean, not many people talking about Twitter being a broadcasting media, but it uh, really is. Uh, but the, what's different between the other media and the, you know, the, the, the other media actions happening right after the earthquake was that the other, probably the other newspaper, I don't know about the BBC, but you know, they received, they checked with their, uh, the Twitters and uh, then also that they uh, kind of, uh, they could identify which person is a kind of a trusted origin of the tweet, tweet, tweets. Okay, so, so they're already, already a tweet, uh, trust 
in there, the personal messages around the world. Okay, that is, I agree with uh, Nick about that. Uh, you know, the traditional media, like uh, you know, the, the the broadcasters and the, the uh, newspaper and the other uh, things. I mean, edited and uh, you know, the the moderated. But also, in addition to that, we do have a personal information uh, to access. And then uh, there is a tremendous of personal, uh, personal messages, as well as the, uh, the information generated automatically from our devices or the cameras and uh, with the location information. In it. And uh, then uh, now the uh, situation has been changing. That's, to me, it's a new media. Great. Thank you. Ross? We live in, uh, in a uh, society where any person, any corporation can be the media. Anyone who's sitting in this audience today tweeting is the media. Um, so I think the distinction is not so much between old and new, um, but it's in how we classify the way that we use the media both to broadcast and as we consume it. Um, we tend to think of it in terms of traditional media, hybrid media, social media and owned media. Uh, and uh, I think it's really important that corporations and governments and people understand that they really need to use all four of those platforms to reach their stakeholders these days. Peter. Very good. Very hard to follow. I don't, not, not much more to say. To be honest. Uh, I, I take a slightly different approach to this and uh, look at it from the user perspective or the, the reader. And um, from the beginning of the internet, and especially now, I think the 311 was a good um, kind of uh, display of how there's a big, there's the, the shift is accelerating from the, the power shift from the publisher being the deliverer of, of everything. Um, to the power shifting over to the user and the user being so empowered with social media and other lots of options out there on, on the internet to get information, uh, to make choices, to get recommendations. Um, so I see the, uh, the, the difference is between companies, uh, publishers, governments that, that can get it, that understand the power shift has already occurred and how do you uh, get what you want from a company strategic um, point of view or from a, a government policy point of view um, and still empower all the users uh, or the readers of whatever it is that you're you're doing um, and, uh, and 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 from my point of view from a small business point of view make money um, because a lot of that empowerment of the user is in complete conflict with the way I make money and I have a few examples of that but I'll stop there Great, thank you. So for this session, I, I thought what would be helpful is um, to try to look at two things. Uh, first of all, focusing on 311, uh, because it's such a, it was such a major thing uh, in Japan, uh, looking at uh, how the government uh, and also the business uh, used, whether it's old media, new media, or a mix of media, and how effective the, they were, and, and what are the learning points. But also, hopefully, sort of putting back at the end to talk about the sort of global picture of how this is evolving. Because Japan is a specific example, 311 being the most pertinent Japanese example in recent years. Uh, but uh, a lot of things like 311 are happening around the world. And what can we take away from that? Now, I want to do that while giving the floor most of the question and answer session. So I, I am going to be restrictive just in the way that Nick is very good at doing this with other people of cutting people off uh, at about five to seven minutes. Uh, but I, I want everyone to be sort of having an initial comment, but really opening it up to uh, the floor uh, after we do that. Now, let me start us off with uh, Murai Sensei. Um, there's, you've done this incredible comparison looking at what happened with the media uh, after the great Hanshin earthquake. And at that point, as I remember, that was the time when mobile phones were starting to penetrate Japan. Uh, you've compared that with 311 and how people have used media as things like uh, Facebook, Twitter, and other social media have appeared. Uh, and I know you've written extensively about it. If you could compress that message about what we can learn uh, from that, that would be fantastic to just set the scene. Okay. Um, yeah, probably, yeah, there, there could be a, you know, 
that was in 95, when I mean, the, the Kobe earthquake was happening. And then they, know, they remember the internet was on the people's hand in the 1995 because of the Windows 95. Okay. Um, so th this is a basically, oh, well, by the way, the, the earthquake was a January 95, therefore uh, the, the, it's a before the internet on the people's hand. So, okay, then, then that was uh, the, well, the, the Kobe earthquake, right? And uh, then, I, but there was a, there was a, um, the PC um, network. I mean, like a, uh, uh, what, a computer server and the other thing. And the, because not, but, but yeah, but, but not the, not the um, internet. Okay, now, comparing with that time and uh, this time, and then a lot of difference, but uh, you know, let me let me state the three things. Okay, one thing is uh, the uh, one common thing, by the way, the because the earthquake in the '95 basically invoked, and the pe get the people notice that uh, power of the internet that time because the internet was not on the people's hand, as, as I said, but that was on the companies and the universities already. Okay, so there was a global internet already existed. And then the people were amazed on that time that, that that was the global messages received from the internet, not from the other media that time. Okay, this time, okay, this is a personal uh, message as, as I mentioned. And then, then this is totally global. Okay, so the question is, uh, you know, it's a global or local? And uh, you know, it's in 95, that was a message was uh, uh, very much local and the, uh, some of the messages came from came in a kind of global manner. This is uh, 2011. You know, this is a totally global, but the, still the message in the local was uh, very much lacking, comparing with the 95. And uh, so uh, that is uh, basically the, the second point is uh, um, the personal devices was uh, uh, communication to be used because it was a battery backup, and then you know the uh, uh, antenna for the 3G cell phone was a battery backup, and uh, you have a, a battery charged devices with you this time, not last time. So uh, then uh, you, your personal communication path was existed this time. You know, most of the cases, I mean, comparing with 95, I mean, of course, uh, you know, many people. The third important point was a digital divide. Digital divide existing on this time, not last time, okay? This time, if you can utilize the old devices, you, if you can access internet, if you can exchange email, you, if you can communicate via Twitter, then you, had a, you have a way to, um, to uh, you know, kind of uh, communicating with your family uh, for the safety messages. But not, uh, if you don't use the cell phone, if you don't use the internet, then you are out of the communication. This difference, was not existing in the 95. So, so it's not always a good thing that we have an issue of a new type of a digital divide. Mm. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Ross, um, if you could, with no sense setting the sort of picture of uh, what's happened in the past 16 years, focusing on this time, uh, but if you could look at it from a, you know, you advise a lot of governments, a lot of corporations, uh, we know that there's been a lot of criticism of how the government has reacted to the earthquake, how it's communicated domestically, internationally. Um, there's been a lot of criticism of several companies uh, about their supply chain, and probably most notably, um, the f a lot of the focus has been on how TEPCO, for example, uh, has communicated within Japan and outside world. Uh, what have you seen uh, in terms of how the users, uh, both public and the private, have used the media uh, during the earthquake, and what can we learn from that? I've got five minutes, right? <laughs> um, I think one of the most interesting things about the 311 um, crisis and the way that the media reacted was um, we, it was the biggest story in the world at the time and we had thousands of journalists from all around the world descend upon Tokyo, um, which of course was relatively unscathed. Um, and they were unable to get up to the Tohoku area. Um, and so they tended to be not writing direct stories, but ne needed to sensationalise it because they had no visuals, nothing to write about. Um, and I think the media at that time were probably, had a great need for information 
to fill the gap that they were, um, uh, that they were uh, because they were not able to get pictures of the real situation up in uh, Tohoku, um, at least not directly. Uh, and so we had a, a, a dynamic where there was a very high demand for uh, information uh, that was not being met adequately by the government um, and corporations, and particularly in this case, I think TEPCO, uh, in the case of the Fukushima um, reactor. Uh, I think the, the interesting thing was that we saw a lot of sensationalism from what we'll call the traditional media, but that effectively was balanced out by the new media, the social media, people on their Twitter accounts, people on their Facebook accounts telling the real story. Um, and, and I think that dynamic is by far the most interesting thing. I think a lot of corporations and the government failed to really pick up on that. Um, they, they sought to address the traditional media in the best way they could um, in a crisis situation with um, the limited information that they probably had at hand um, and really failed to address, as I said before, the owned media, hybrid media, social media, what we call at Edelman the cloverleaf and really look at all those four different components and think strategically about how they might get the information out over, over all of those. I think an interesting point in case is TEPCO. Um, at one stage, TEPCO decided they wanted to get innovative and into the 21st century and started use streaming their press conferences. The problem was they used the digital platform, but they used it in a traditional way. In other words, they were still talking to the reporters in front of them at every press conference and not to the public, which the medium would have allowed. And so it actually backfired because coming through the Ustream camera, it looked like TEPCO was distancing themselves and not really addressing directly the stakeholders. Um, and so you, you could see instances where they tried to adjust and tried to be innovative and use these new platforms, but they failed to address the fact that they needed to use them in a new way and looked at and tried to do them in a traditional way, and I think that's where we saw a lot of failure. Uh, and I think a lot of lessons learned. I think we're seeing uh, companies now being a little bit more creative and understanding. Great. Peter, um, you run a business <coughs> uh, in Japan, uh, a media in Japan. Um, what, what did you see uh, during the crisis, and, and, and in general, you know, how, how do you see the sort of market evolving here? Uh, well, we saw a year's worth of traffic in an hour, and uh, it was very difficult to deal with that uh, sudden influx of traffic coming from all over the world, uh, which I think kind of just shows, I mean, we're, we're a small guy, right? We're japantoday.com, we're, we're a niche, we're Japan-only news. Um, and I guess one of the reasons why we got all that traffic is because our guy was, was running into the shaking building to, uh, to write the story and, and get it off to the social networks and, uh, and through our, our, our network of um, partner sites for content distribution. But there was an absolute um, void of uh, available information. Um, most of our stories come from, from the, the wires, um, but we also had uh, people um, going up to the up to uh, Fukushima area and uh, writing stories. Um, but the main thing you know, for us was to get as much information as possible. And we have contracts that we have to keep with the wire services, and they didn't quite, um, well, they were <laughs> basically, they, they didn't cover the needs of our users. So going back to the users thing, our users were demanding from us information. And so we um, used a lot of, uh, well, we bent the contract a little bit to get as much uh, information out there as possible um, for, for, the, um, for the user. So, which basically meant at the end of the crisis, uh, we lost one of our our news feed uh, suppliers, but um, the uh, yeah, I think the what it, what it kind of showed for for us was just the the um, in in Japan and this niche, this English niche, niche. There is uh, not enough English information out there, and I I don't know if it's an English problem. Maybe it's just uh, maybe it's a problem, an information problem here um, for Japan. So uh, and then on another note, I, th I thought it was, it was a great opportunity for Japan to really shine. And, and they did on a, on a lot of social levels, uh, you know, no writing, no, um, 
what do you call it when the people steal stuff? Looting. No looting. <laughs> That's right. well, yeah. No looting and you know, very orderly and uh, everybody looking after each other. So on that level, I think the world really got that. But from, I guess from, uh, from a political level and from other, you know, it was, it was a great chance because Japan was in the spotlight and unfortunately I don't think uh, they did, did so well. Um, and now what we're doing as a company is we're basically um, trying our bit to promote Japan again because there are a lot of, obviously there's a lot of, a lot of great things uh, about living and working here in Japan. So we are doing our best as we can as a small company to promote Japan as a place to live and work. And it's tough because the, the mainstream media really, really did a really good job of... Um, destroying all of the great cred that uh, Japan has built over, over the last, uh, well, over time. So even though Japan is a, is a great place to, to, to work, especially, and a lot of great business happening here, a lot of innovation, etc., um, for some reason people are just looking at, at China, because China's the next big thing, but hey, Japan is still here, it's a great economy. Okay, thank you so much. Nick, um, if you could, um, I mean, Touch on 311, but but you you have covered these kind of crises all around the world. Um, if you could provide 311 within that global context, what can we take away? The the tragedy. The tragedy of um, 311 was big enough. <clears throat> it was made worse by the information handling, just as Ross has highlighted. Um, yes, I appear on television. I'm a, a main presenter, but I've also done a lot of work on this, which is summarized in a work called Sky Full of Lies and Black Swans, which was published two years ago. Unfortunately, Andrew from, uh, uh, from Rand um, recognized it earlier today. Why do I say that? Because the work that I've done, which is peer reviewed at Oxford University, about sky full of lies, a rejection of what is happening out there in the new public information space, which is much broader than the, the media as we think of it. It's the public information space, which has essentially turned the whole thing on its head, where those at the top no longer have the power that they believe institutionally they will have because they're in power, whether they're corporates or governments. So the two came together here with the handling by the government, and I know you were involved in setting up the process, even though you just left the office just before all this happened. But the, the, this came together both in the corporate and the government field. Sky Full of Lies rejecting a lot, and that's based on what happened in Burma four years ago. But also, um, black swans, we don't realize what we don't realize. And it's true to type what happened in, 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 uh, here in Japan, tragically. And it's comparable to what happened to BP, which led to Tony Hayward, the chief executive, having to resign. It's the same as what has happened right across the Arab awakening. Why didn't Tunisia learn from Iran? Why didn't Egypt learn from Tunisia? Why didn't Libya, why didn't Gaddafi learn from Egypt? Why has Syria not learned from what's been happening right across this region? Similarly, I could say the same thing about David Cameron, our prime minister in Britain who was on holiday when we had the extraordinary um, unrest in parts of London, which all of you will, will be aware of. London ablaze was the type, were, were the headlines. But those who were on the streets with their mobile phones were providing more information of what was going on than even the police knew about what was happening in places like uh, Clapham or Tottenham, and the same thing in Whitehall. So what we're talking about here is a new phenomenon which I would categorize in this way, which I say in all my work. We're talking about a new vulnerability, fragility, and brittleness of power in times of crisis because the public information space, not just the media, has been turned on its head. This, in turn, is forcing a new accountability. The public is knowing much more than the governments and the corporates believe they know. When on a smartphone, and this is the big um, expansion in, in the IT business, when on a smartphone you can get a tweet, you can get a blog, and you can now get virtually live video, and people are standing there in the middle of a crisis saying, well, I can see it here. Why am I not hearing from the government? Why am I not hearing from the corporate? One of the critical reasons is, as you saw here within government and also within the corporates within TEPCO, often they didn't have the information themselves, or they had the information, and there wasn't a culture within either the government or the company to understand the absolute imperative to get information out there. What happened on the 11th of March and afterwards here was the cry going out, just give us information, 
Give us good information. Don't worry about a press conference. This is a 24-7 environment. The news cycle doesn't wait on one press conference a day. It's not helped when the cabinet secretary and TEPCO are in are having a public row about what the hell is going on, uh, as, the, uh, as was quoted from, I think, the cabinet secretary or the prime minister. But the same thing happened in BP. The same thing happened with the British Airports Authority back in December, if any of you were trying to go through Heathrow. They didn't understand that the public sitting in terminals one, three, and five, and four were sitting there knowing there were 30 tons of snow on every, uh, on every single stand. They were looking at their mobile phones and saying, where is the information? What we're talking about here is a complete disconnect. And what you saw on the 11th of March and shortly afterwards is true to type. Black swans, we don't realize what we don't realize. So in all the crisis management, you can be prepared with the blue, blue light services and your rescue teams, but it's understanding now the imperative that the public expect information. And if the public don't get that information, even if it's constantly modified, hour after hour, minute after minute, then they suspect that the people in charge are not uh, up to the job. So brittleness and fragility of power. Secondly, this enforced accountability. But above all, wherever you are, whether you're the British Airports Authority, the British government, or you're one of the, uh, one of the governments in, the, in, in, in North Africa, or you're the Chinese government during the high-speed train crash and what happened in Dalian with the big, big protest recently, it's questioning, under the rubric, a deficit of legitimacy. People are beginning to say, in these times of crisis, I know, why don't they tell me? I don't believe them, therefore they're less relevant. And so this is part of a trend, and tragically you've been through it here. And I was struck by hearing, and this was on the record, um, from the head of the planning department at the foreign ministry. We met at a conference uh, in Brussels at the end of March. And he said on the record that we all had the information within government. We didn't understand the absolute necessity to get it through the system, get it up there and out there so the public knew what was going on. In other words, th there are three other points which I want to make to you finally. This is about mindsets. And the mindsets don't understand the profound change in the public information space. This in turn is creating an absolute imperative now for behavior, behavioral change. It doesn't cost money. It's about civil servants and corporate executives from chief executive right down through the system understanding that something is profoundly different and it's changing by the day and by the hour, not by the month and the year. So these are critical areas summed up with one, one word, denial, sky full of lies. It isn't happening. We're in control. It's completely the opposite now. The public empowerment is, uh, is, is sweeping, not in a way which you should blame them for. This is great for journalism. It's holding us traditional journalists. It's holding our feet to the fire. If we get things wrong or not accurate enough, we're told very quickly through tweets and blogs. So our journalism is getting better. But this issue of denial, those out there at the tops and middle ranks and generationally towards the top of companies and governments don't understand that the system is profoundly different. And tragically, what you saw on the 11th of March is only the latest and one of the most tragic examples of how ill-equipped most institutions of power are to handle all of this now. Nick, can you, can you describe, I'm just going to go to the book. Uh, can you show, the, I, I just want right. to make sure that everyone catches this book. I didn't ask him to ask me to do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can download it free off the web, Sky Full of Lies and Black Swans. Yeah, great, thank but you. But interestingly, I have to say 41,000 people have downloaded it in the last year, in its second year of publication. I'm not making any money out of it. That shows there are a lot of people out there, including from many countries who I won't mention here, who are in semi-authoritarian regimes who are worried about this, but know that the systems are not re robust enough to cope. Right, Ross? You know, um, I guess seven, 10 years ago, um, I would sit across the table from clients and crisis situations or adversarial situations, and I'd say to the CEO, I'd say, this is very simple. The equation is access to information plus quality of information equals controlling the media. So you just need to be available 24 hours a day. You need to be there. You need to have a higher degree of quality than the guy on the other side of the crisis. Very simple. 
But it doesn't work that way anymore because the access to information is out there in the public. You can't, you can't beat seven billion people who are, who are tweeting. So the whole dynamic has changed completely. And it's not really only at that very high level in terms of governments and corporations. We've just done an interesting study on health and the socialization of health, and people don't believe what their doctors tell them anymore. There's two dynamics. People either look it up on the web first, and then go and ask their doctor if what they read on the internet is correct, or they take the information their doctor gives them, and then they go and look it up on the web to check whether their doctor's telling them the right thing. And the percentage is about the same. So it's this whole breakdown of trust that we're beginning to see going on at all levels of society. Okay. Um, yeah. Let me share the you know because because the chairman uh, asked us uh, to stick on a, a March 11 thing, right? Okay. Let me share uh, one of my experiences uh, uh, right after the the earthquake, and uh, then uh, I received a call from uh, uh, Suzuki Sam, the vice minister of uh, uh, minister of education, uh, who's in charge of the distributing the data of the um, the radiation activity from a Fukushima uh, explosion. Okay. And uh, then uh, uh, he called me, and uh, then uh, he, he said uh, he, he's got a problem with, uh, you know, the, because of the tremendous access to their, their, their websites. And uh, then uh, they want the, all the uh, radiation activities uh, information. And uh, then you know, I, I said, uh, okay, I can help from the internet, uh, you know, uh, point of view that, uh, to share with, uh, with the people. And uh, then you know, I started to work on that. And then what I received from them was uh, one PDF file uh, with, uh, with all the numbers of uh, radiation activities around. And uh, so then that was, uh, you know, uh, the tags, explanation, all in Japanese, okay? That was uh, basically image data. And uh, then you know, how I can share, and uh, you know, most of the information, I mean, the, the question I asked from all over the world and then you know, that data is a number in the Japanese. Okay, so how can we share this one? And then, you know, then I asked them that uh, could we change? Could we OCR them? And uh, then I put that into the numbers and uh, they hesitated because uh, of the, all the errors. I'm gonna manipulate that, that data and then it's gonna be difficult. And then, uh, of, okay, if you don't trust me on the OCR, I mean OCR technology, not me, but <laughs> then, then you know, then give, give us the numbers, I mean data. And then you know, they, they, now finally they gave us uh, Excel data. Okay, then the Excel data, then they, we, you still cannot distribute that for the manipulation thing. And then they, finally numbers. And then they, of course we generate, we could ge now generate it from the Excel two numbers. And uh, then, uh, um, then put that on an accessible manner. And then all of the work, they're going to visualize it, right. analyzing it, right. and they started to use that. And then I have all the, you know, the access log uh, from all of the world. So this is a data generated from the government. Mm -hmm. But uh, then you know, this is a kind of a trusted data. But the manipulation and the visualization, utilization into the information was done in a, somewhere or everywhere on the internet. Okay, this is now um, probably learned by our government now. Mm. Okay, so the, the multiple languages, oh, by the way, the multiple language was translated by the Keio University student and they, for the, the 11 uh, you know, languages. So that was not done originally by the government and uh, no uh, reusable data was generated from the government from the first point, but uh, now week by week, they started to uh, change it. And all the languages that we are translating by the students, now done by the, some professional inside the government structure. So after the two months, and then you know, all the data generated from the government is uh, simply numbers, accessible, uh, remanipulated by, from the, the, you know, anywhere in the world. Now, and then the multiple languages, especially on the English, started from. So uh, they learned a lot. I mean, you learned how to, no, no, not you. you, you left the government already. <laughs> but anyway, so, so I, I think that was the experiences I had. So uh, this is a, certainly the very good experiences of our government for the, you know, generating the information to the, to the net. Great, thank you so much. I, I'm gonna open up to the floor, uh, but I'm, I have, as a chair, I have the privilege of 
also calling on people on, uh, on the floor. So Kaji-san uh, is sitting back there. Uh, he, uh, uh, just for people who don't know, Kaji-san used to um, run a lot of the new programs uh, at Nissan uh, in terms of communications. Um, one of the very few good things that I did in government uh, as I was leaving last December was to um, have someone like Kaji-san come into our global communication office. Um, and, uh, and he's been instrumental in terms of setting up the global communication uh, room, uh, getting government on Twitter, Facebook, uh, having press conferences, um, and also, uh, you know, I think, touching on what Murai-san was talking about, um, letting a lot of information flow out, although probably, you know, from the discuss discussion today, not enough, probably not because of Kaji-san, but because of a lot of resistance. Uh, in the government for getting stuff like that out. But I'm going to come back to him uh, after a while uh, and reflect on the discussion as the person trying to implement uh, a lot of things. Because clearly, you could do a lot of stuff in Nissan that has been successful. You had those ideas. You were in government. There was a crisis. You know, what could you do? What couldn't you do? What can we take away from that? So I'm going to call on him uh, after a while. Uh, but uh, let me open up the floor for any questions. now. Um, one question each, can you name who you are uh, and also choose the person who want, you want answered? So no multiple questions, no, can everyone make a comment? Okay, so I'm gonna start with you, two, three, four, okay. Hi, it's Steve McClure, freelance writer. I can only ask a question of one person? Uh, or Initially, please. Initially, okay, well, <laughs> I'll see who goes for this. Um, returning to the theme of Japan itself, in a society such as Japan's where uh, uh, traditional media ownership has been very concentrated historically. To what extent and how can new media help Japan become a more open, democratic, and less hierarchical society? Great. H who do you want to have? Um, well, Nick says, says, well, no, no, okay. Because um, I said I would help Nick avoid jet lag, but... Um, <laughs> that's, not the, that's not the issue. That's not the one. Okay. All right. Um, any of the other gentlemen, please, then? I think maybe Murai, Murai san if I can call on you to answer. He, uh, Murai san sits on many of the important government committees that looks at uh, the role of media in society. So. Well, actually, the, the, the topics of uh, this session are all the new media. I mean, you know, the, the we've been, you know, working, I've been, I've been working for a long time, probably past uh, five, ten years with the Japanese broadcasters uh, to work with the, uh, the internet. And so the web and the TV uh, is uh, one of the subjects uh, you know, that Japan kind of initiated. But uh, recently, the European uh, EBU, European Broadcasters Union, uh, generated the 19 principles on the you know, relationship with the internet and TV. Actually, the, during the earthquake experiences, that, you know, that is exactly what happened on a, on a traditional media uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, Experienced with the utilization of the uh, the internet and other uh, personal media uh, together, so uh, I think uh, you know the 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 getting back to your original question, the how can we uh, kind of modernize uh, the Japanese traditional media? I think uh, that's a really big issue, and uh, it can be happening with uh, uh, kind of uh, setting up the principles of. Uh, 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 traditional media relating to the internet media uh, and how they can they can do. I mean, regulation, other things, and a lot of uh, conventions, uh, they can kind of uh, fix things. Uh, you know, that's a good start. Can I comment? Sure. No, yeah. I'm sorry, I can't contribute anything about Japan, but uh, certainly what we're seeing around the world, and I don't know how different Jap Japan is, particularly with the next generation, not the young generation, but the next generation, is the way people are consuming. And we should talk about not channels or old and new media, but platforms. In the end, I produce digital video, but digital video which appears on multiple platforms. One of the dilemmas for the BBC is, under our licensing arrangement, whether if people consume what we produce on a laptop or on a PC, does that mean they should be charged a license fee? Because they're consuming, but they're not consuming under the old Radio Telegraphy Act. Now, I put that in because it, it underlines one important thing, that people are consuming information in multiple different ways. They're looking for brand strength and places they can rely upon. And um, I'm slightly surprised if, um, and I've got to be careful how I put this because I know I'm on the record, but if the platforms here are simply not adapting to this new reality because we're having to adapt, otherwise we don't have a place in the market. End of story. Um, second question was back there, three, four, yeah. Please. 
Uh, thanks very much. Do you think it's a bit... Um, uh, can you name yourself? Sorry. Uh, Dan Slater from The Economist Group. Do you think it's uh, somewhat absurd to conflate um, uh, technology platforms like Twitter um, and so on uh, with journalism? Journalism, of course, has the function, the, the, the mission of producing information which is fact-checked um, as much as possible. It seems to me that the contrast is not between old and new media, but be between unfounded, um, unfounded speculation and information that actually um, rides, uh, or, or, which can punish the journalist if he gets it wrong or reward him if he gets it right. And who's that for? Um, that's for Nick as okay, a Nick, journalist. Yes. Uh, I think you're looking at it through the wrong, um, wrong angle and through the prism. Twitter is now a very significant, not just because James is here, but Twitter is now a very significant uh, part of the news gathering business. Um, uh, I was at a meeting of political advisors for the European Union where I was talking to them a couple of weeks ago, and um, a couple of the, the people in the audience said to me, or the delegates there who were in the learning curve said, do you think we should have a Twitter account at our missions? And I said, haven't you got one already? Twitter is an important, it's a critical, it could have been invented by somebody else, but Twitter is a, an incredibly important part of the news gathering business. Yes, we at the BBC validate, we mediate, and we check. But if I tell you when Rupert Murdoch was hit in the face in the British Parliament, which all of you will remember, uh, particularly Wendy's right hook <laughs> towards the man who uh, threw this, uh, what we then discovered was uh, shaving foam. I was on air at the time, and we, we know the hashtags of a lot of the people who were in there, and they were twittering, tweeting extremely quickly, and I was able within about a minute to go on air and say, well, he's just been hit in the face, uh, by it appears to be shaving cream, and it's probably cheap, cheap shaving cream because it had a particularly foul odor. <laughs> now, I knew the source of that tweet, and therefore the journalism was just as good as any other journalism, like picking up a telephone or walking out into the corridor. A lot of what we've had from North Africa, particularly from Libya, has come from Twitter. Um, and again, not just because James is sitting here. So I think you're taking a rather traditional, suspicious view of this. Yes, we have to be careful. Yes, we have to mediate. Yes, we have to authenticate. But it speeded up the, 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 the delivery of hard fact to an amazing level where the time, the, the time shift is possibly no longer than one or two minutes. That's amazing. Great. I'd like to make just one, one comment. On sure. That. Mm -hmm. uh, the, other, the other thing um, to consider is um, what the user or what, the, what people out there believe. And in the past it was, okay, I'm going to sit down at 6 o'clock every night and watch the news and that's, that's the reality. Um, but now the reality is I believe this guy, I don't even know, he's made a comment about something and he has this fact. Wow, really? And that's now the... I, I'm, a, I'm a user, I don't fact check. That's too hard basket. I'm not going to do that, but I go to japantoday.com, I read the news, and then under the news, there's all these comments. And the comments are just as compelling as the, the actual fact-checked fact uh, article. Um, so I think that's another thing to, to realise, is the, what, the, what people believe is the word of mouth. And that's, for, for better or for worse, very powerful. Great. Could I just add? Sure. You know, if, if someone is tweeting and they see a puff of steam come out of Fukushima or out of another nuclear plant or elsewhere, and it's from a reliable hashtag, you believe them? Third question. I didn't, I didn't say if. I said if you know the person who's sending it. Okay. Third question, yes. Uh, my name is Satoshi Hirose. I am a corporate executive officer of a company which is handling call center operations and contact center operations and also some, do some work um, researching the social media. Now, my question is to Nick, or possibly if, if the others are okay. Um, as Nick mentioned, uh, I, I totally agree that the vulnerability and agility of the social society is being triggered by the social media. The more I meet with the CEOs of companies, I see, observe some kind of fear or some con strong concern about how can we govern the company with this kind of situation? What would be the key successful factor to, to survive in this kind of a enormously swiftly changing environment? They say that 
I have a clear vision to cope with, but my organization can't handle that. Now, I think now we are in a time of a new survival, the new era of a survival of the fittest. And I want to know your opinions on what would be the key to, to be a strong, nimble uh, organization. Thank you. So, Nick, your million dollar question. Is that all? <laughs> Ross will be able to um, answer what it's like when he's hired by a large corporation to uh, resolve the dilemma in their minds as to what to do. I will give you my perspective, not least because I give quite a lot of presentations, not many, to corporates and governments. And I'd say still that there's an enormous level of denial, uh, which is why I still call it the sky full of lies, because most people hope it'll go away and it won't affect them. Uh, as opposed to realizing that this is the likelihood of it them being hit by this, particularly if they're in the risk business, where the Qantas with an A380, which has lost a cowling because there's been a malfunction in an engine which could have left, left, left 500 dead, and the, the chief executive didn't know for more than almost an hour that this had happened, even though that on, on Twitter the pictures were coming in from northern Indonesia of the cowling sitting on the ground with a kangaroo um, painted on it. Um, it's this still, that's why I use that word, denial. There is still a level of denial, and Pete, uh, Ross should be saying this rather than me, but the Edelman Trust Barometer back in January uh, showed a very important change this year, which was the public expect to hear right from the top now, which includes the chief executive. That's a big change from a year ago. Uh, <clears throat> and it's, it's a reluctant um, change that most are prepared to make, but I would say that by and large, a significant number of those who've made it to the top of that generation find it really difficult to say, to actually even begin to embrace the inevitability of what I've described, certainly, which is why I talk about denial, fragility, and vulnerability, because most generationally, as we saw, dare I say, in TEPCO here, do not want to even accept the vulnerability, and therefore, it's a critical part of their corporate planning. Now, can you just elaborate on, if you have that right mindset, you know, what are the one or two things that you should be doing tangibly? Why didn't you ask Ross that? Because that's what he tells you. Okay, somebody. Ross. <laughs> Ross. Uh, yeah, I think it, it is a mindset issue. Um, and I think the first step is the realisation that it is a very complex world out there and that CEOs and companies need to embrace the complexity rather than try and simplify the complexity. Um, is that first, that's the big mindset change, I think. The second thing is, I think CEOs need to listen more intelligently. It's an engagement issue, not a public, well, it's not a public relations world anymore, it's a public engagement world. Um, and engagement means a two-way conversation is at the core of that engagement. So it's not the CEO communicating his corporate strategy to his employees anymore, it's him going out and listening intelligently to the conversations that are going on out there and then finding out how he may be able to influence those conversations or participate in those conversations. I think they're the really two, two key points. Embrace the complexity and listen with intelligence. But there's a lot of denial still. Yeah, there's a lot. Of, there is, and, and I think the denial is about the need to do those two things. Ross, okay, okay, if, if I... Let, let's say I'm... I'm uh, corporate executive or I'm a head of the government, and let me try to push back, even if I don't have denial. So one example we saw um, after the earthquake was uh, Mr. Edano, uh, the chief cabinet secretary of the person. Now, just for everyone, chief cabinet secretary uh, in Japan has three functions that are typically split uh, in other governments. One, he's the chief spokesman, uh, but he's also the chief cabinet coordinator who coordinates uh, all of the cabinet decisions, so he's a policy Leader. He's also uh, the, uh, the key, uh, he has the management uh, of the sort of whole cabinet secretariat uh, of the prime minister's office. So typically they would be split along at least the spokesman and the chief of staff, and uh, and sometimes the sort of chair of the cabinet meetings. Uh, but in Japan, this is one person. So with that background, one of the most popular hashtags on Twitter uh, after the earthquake was Edano Nero, which means <laughs> Edano get some sleep. You know, this guy was up probably 20 hours a day, reporting every two hours for several weeks, um, which is unsustainable, but he was the person, and many people around the world thought that he was the prime minister, <laughs> because <laughs> he was the person speaking on behalf of Japan. But at the same time, he had a job of being the chief of staff of the government that was reacting policy-wise 
to everything that was going on, while also driving a lot of cabinet decisions across all the ministries. So, so one pushback uh, could be that if I'm in a crisis, I'm a CEO, uh, I have a lot of administrative and business decisions that I need to be making. I need to be reaching out to my partners. People are expecting me to react every five minutes to the latest thing that's going on. Is this even humanly possible? And how can I do it even if I want to do it? Uh, it's not humanly possible. <laughs> um, and I think the, 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 the Edelman Trust Barometer, uh, which uh, very kindly referred to, um, shows a couple of things and a couple of different dynamics in different countries. It's true, when we compare the data to five years ago or even two years ago, people want to hear from the CEO. They trust the title more than they did a couple of years ago. But the CEO isn't the only person that they need to hear sure. from. And in fact, in the United States, if it's a recall issue or a crisis involving technology, people prefer to hear from a technological expert, the guy who's running the technology. The mistake Toyota made in America was, in, but in Japan, the data shows that in Japan, people still expect to hear from the CEO. So I'm sure Toyota sat there saying, we, in our market, everyone needs to hear from the CEO. So we need to get the CEO to America to do this, but there was obviously denial within the organization in the first stages. But they didn't really need to do that. All they needed to do was have the CEO come out and say, you know, we're treating this very seriously. I have selected this guy who's the head of Toyota the US, in the US and my, you know, in charge of the technology to handle this and he's reporting to me on three times a day and this is what we're doing and have that person be the spokesperson. The CEO doesn't, he, he needs to drive the process but he doesn't have to do it all himself. Got it, okay, Nick? Yeah, the idea that a single human being or any human being has to be the only font of knowledge in a crisis is from an age which has passed, in my view. What we need is public information which is sourceable. And I'm still amazed at the unwillingness, getting back to that fr phrase which both uh, Ross and I have used, embracing this new reality. I work in a newsroom where a large number of journalists now rely on what's on a screen for their journalism rather than picking up a telephone. I don't say that in a critical way. That's the new reality. Far too many governments and corporates are simply not using a website to get basic information out, to show that they are engaged, to show that they're on top of it, which means it doesn't have to be the chief executive, it can be done in his name, but you have a, you have a devolution of power. And power, after all, people have jobs in order to fulfill those jobs and shouldn't be appointed to the jobs unless they can handle the public space. We're talking about what I've christened a race for space. If you're not in it, then certainly others will be in the space, however unreliable they are. If you post it, as with British Airports Authority or anyone else, if you post it on a website and you make that a first port of call for those who want 24-7 information, backed up by a 24-7 newsroom wherever you're working in a government or a corporate, then at least you will have clarity. Uh, there can be questioning. Uh, that can be done in a press conference. But I still am amazed at the number of those in crisis situations who are still not prepared to have in place a system which, rather like Ross has just said, has a series of people who are empowered to be the voice or the name in which good, hard information is produced. Not in several hours, but a handful of minutes. And that's critical. Great, thank you. Next question. My name is Václav Bošek, I'm a student from Globis, and my question was actually partially answered just now, but I will ask anyway. Um, we have seen in the past that um, the, the, the power of Twitter, Facebook, and, and all these new media is, is, is immense, and governments fell in, in, in Africa, in, in the Middle East. Is there one single thing, a thing governments can do to sort of prevent and, and protect their credibility, because it's, it's an issue of credibility, an issue of... Um, um, the, the, whole, the whole system, um, because my feeling is that if, uh, for example, take North Korea, it's, it's a very extreme example, if the same thing happens in North Korea, okay, they are controlling the internet, whatever, but should the same thing happen, there's nuclear arms involved in it, what can, let's say, the government in North Korea do to prevent the, the same thing that happened in, 
in uh, Egypt, Libya. I, 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 let me make sure I understand your question. Is, is your question, if, 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 if it's a good thing for North Korea to preserve the regime, what can they be doing to stop or Rather, what, what they can do uh, to um, protect themselves. Okay. And, and any government in, in general, not only okay. North Korea. Okay. Well, the North, the North Koreans have done it. You can't use a cell phone in North Korea. End of story. <laughs> Um, when it comes to my, what I, my analysis, I always say the only place you can't, this won't be a risk, is in North Korea. So you've chosen the wrong example. Um, but uh, very clearly, what you've got to do is, and it comes back to two of the bullet points I gave you. First of all, understand that the mindset is out of kilter with the new reality. Appreciate that. And secondly, therefore, change behavior. Once you do both of those, in my view, there's a chance that you will be ready to handle this problem and it won't end up with either your brand and image being destroyed or certainly reputation and probably, as is happening on, in a vast number of cases now, um, careers being destroyed at the same time. There have been a number of careers which have been destroyed politically here in Japan. The same thing happened to Tony Haywood and at a seminar a month after he formally left BP in November of last year in Cambridge University, he actually said, these were my black swan moments. Even he, running a risk corporation around the world, involved in risks like Texas, Texas City, the oil refinery, the rusting of the pipes up in, in North Slope, Alaska, even he had not fully understood just how profound the impact of this new public information space is. BP did not realize last year that 22%, I'll repeat that, 22% of the social media space in the United States was consumed by only one issue, and that was the Gulf of Mexico and BP. That's what brought him down, and it brought down the company. They're recovering now. But that is the scale and the profound impact that this has. Let me pause before I get questions, and Kajisan, I think I've given you 20 minutes <laughs> to prepare for your response. Uh, I think, um, you know, you, you were in this space, you knew what was going on, you're now in government, uh, and, and, you know, what are the, what are the real challenges uh, that you're facing today? Okay, um, my name is Kaji, and uh, working for, uh, worked for Nissan six years, then I uh, joined government, generally introduced by uh, Daisuke Iwase, who was doing another uh, session right now, uh, to James. And James hired me, uh, which is really uh, a challenging uh, position. Um, after the nine months of uh, uh, days in the government, I have found one thing which related to the, uh, today's discussion, which is the uh, trends, uh, diminishing boundaries, uh, diminishing or uh, disappearing boundaries or walls. What we have, uh, we have been separated from all other world that because we have wall, but that wall is going to be diminished or dis, uh, disappearing. So that is the awareness we should have right now. So we are getting into the error of diminishing wall or boundaries or uh, uh, <coughs> dis disappear disappearing the walls or, or uh, boundaries. For example, boundaries of countries. We used to have boundaries with any other countries. But it was, uh, of course, diminished and uh, disappeared. And risk. Risk is very interrelated, and we cannot separate one by one. Once some uh, natural disaster happened in uh, any other countries, it is going to lead to the fiscal uh, risks, and it's going to uh, risk to the food supply and supply chains. It's going to be all interrelated. So there is no walls, boundaries between them. And for example, old media and new medias. There is no boundaries, there is no walls differentiate old and new because we have been facing the feedback effect between old and new. If Edano san was said in Nero uh, Edano in the Twitter, it will be reported in news, a newspaper and it will be feedback to the, uh, uh, the new uh, media as well. So I think we should aware that we are getting into the new era which does not have uh, walls or boundaries. For example, the transparency. You know, uh, the company like Olympus has been facing with the uh, uh, big trans transparency issues, which is clearly the lack of awareness of the, we are uh, no more having the walls uh, to protect themselves. The information is uh, broadly spread in an instant manner, so I think we should be aware of that. To cope with those kind of changes, we uh, go about a communications office to two uh, uh, approaches. One is inter-ministry uh, inter uh, organizations. 
uh, as you can say that, that the ministry is be, uh, very uh, silo, but uh, we started to have a discussion over, uh, over the uh, inter ministries. So as you can see, uh, today's discussion, we have uh, Commissioner Kondo, and he will work for the media uh, tomorrow. So those kind of inter-ministry approach must be needed. And also, uh, the second uh, initiative is inter-sector uh, initiatives. Like uh, uh, Mr. Kondo said that, that regardless of the, your roles and your positions, you have to contribute to the country or global uh, communities. So, uh, so thanks to the uh, Kondo san I tapped into the government. And I'm very glad he gave back to the government as well. So those kind of uh, role-less or position-less move uh, or uh, approaches must be needed. That is my observation. So we think we should get into that uh, new era, which does not have a wall or boundary anymore. Nick, comment? Could I just ask, how much resistance are you still facing? And how much is the mindset even beginning to change to understand what you've just said? You mean from the internal government? In the government, government yeah. I think that uh, there is a separation, uh, 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 generation, sep uh, generation uh, separation is there. I have to say that, that uh, people under age 45 are pretty flexible, around 45, pretty flexible to the new uh, momentum or new complexity or new uh, mindset. But I have to say that direct level, but uh, that all the people, or the uh, managers tend to be very reluctant to change their uh, mindset or leadership style. So I think that the next generation is going to be more responsible. I think that the government is going to change. Maybe you can smell that transformation from uh, Furukawa-san's uh, speech uh, this morning. And also some of the uh, politician here is uh, different from the old fashioned uh, politicians. I think you already noticed that. That is a generation gap situation. Okay. Yeah. Am, okay. I, am I uh, clear enough? Uh, I mean, uh, I think the quick answer to Nick's question is, is, uh, is a huge resistance. Uh, so <laughs> well, that's um, it's difficult for Kazuki-san to say that. But uh, I mean, what he was talking about, I mean, inter, in, interdepartmental coordination in government uh, is, is, uh, is almost, uh, I wouldn't say impossible but uh, extremely difficult. So to drive something that seems so normal like that is, is huge. Uh, also bringing outside people, the, engaging the public or even the, uh, the businesses or the NGOs into a government decision-making process is almost uh, unthinkable for most people. So I think you know, the two things that he raised which seem quite normal are completely abnormal uh, in government, and anyone trying to push that uh, obviously would face a, a lot of resistance. I think it's it. important, if I can just give a reflection, that what you're facing in the way you've just described it is typical of every government. Mm -hmm. um, no government I know, apart from maybe the US State Department now, which uh, through Alec Ross and Anne-Marie Slaughter and the, the Secretary of State herself, they've really made big strides in the last year. There's a lot to learn from them, um, and it's odd to be giving that kind of level of compliment to the US government in particular, but I can tell you, there are many, many governments who I've spoken to who I believe I've almost been talking to a brick wall. And if there is a generational change, those below feel oppressed. They realize the new reality is necessary and has to be embraced, but they feel oppressed by the generational overload from the top and also just the system which simply can't adapt at the speed that the information space is changing. So I don't think you're alone on this. The question is how all of you manage to meet this demand and when people like me in my organization phone you up and say we want information not next week but now. So I, I want the panelists to wrap up for five minutes at the end. I have five more minutes. Let me pick up like two more questions. Uh, I have seven hands up. Um, I okay. okay, let me, let me, um, let me, okay, let me, let's go through, can you actually, can we go through the questions, and then I'll have the panelists wrap up, but also address some of the points. So let me, for those people whose hands, hands were up, I, I saw about six or seven, yeah, just keep them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, okay, six of them, let's, let's just run through them. Okay, go ahead. And can you name yourself? Sorry. I didn't know there was time. Roger Pulvers. I'd like to ask you, Mr. Kondo, as someone involved, yes, okay. in this particular area. There's been, uh, uh, since the, around the middle Meiji era, a tendency, almost a national characteristic in this country, 
to avoid confrontation. There's no such thing in Japan. There hasn't been for 150 years of what one would call shirukenri, the, the, the right to know. In fact, the Japanese have a right not to know. They feel they don't want to know. It's the Japanese people who are in denial, not the media or the government. Um, in, uh, the fact that WikiLeaks was, taken, uh, was, taken, was not taken seriously in this country uh, as it was in Britain and Germany and to a certain extent in the United States is, is part, uh, certainly illustrative of that. Uh, I think the Japanese have a profound uh, uh, hatred of anything that smacks of whistleblowing or giving out any kind of information which people don't feel they, they have a right, they should know because it's, it's not about me, it's about somebody else and they, they close their ears to it. I mean, there was a film called Mimi o Sumatseba, but the, that doesn't, that, they don't do that. Uh, so is, there, is this changing in Japan, the people who are your constituency? Uh, do you feel that there's more demanding, uh, that they don't go around saying, you know, I want them to do it, they, that they go around saying, I want things changed, I want to know. Because certainly in the several generations that preceded this one, this was this was not uh, evident. Okay, Thank you. Great. That's yep. Um, this gentleman. Oh, my name is Seiji Yasubuchi. I work for J Capital, and a simple question. So, given all the changes, what would be the best defense for the company? Has it fundamentally changed? Okay. Great. Okay. Others? Yes, please. Yes. Uh, I'm Nobuyoshi Hori from uh, Global University student, and I got a quite a challenging question. That uh, why don't you mix up the uh, old and new type of media? For example, on the, the uh, March 11th, on the each station there are no English information available, so the foreigners were suffered because they're at loss. So just mix up the uh, new media on hanging on the station so that everybody can see the Twitter, official Twitter from JR or some other transportation company or the bus stops, bus stations. Why don't you think about a uh, mixture of new media and old stuff? Okay. Others, yes. Uh, I'm Koki Uchiyama, the CEO of Hotlink. Our company is uh, uh, serving the social media analysis at the monitoring tool. And uh, I want to get uh, feedback from you about my uh, new idea about uh, missing a piece of media. Uh, I think uh, from the, uh, many companies uh, want to promote their product or company name uh, with less money by uh, Facebook or Twitter. But that is a dream or a future. And from the viewpoint of analysis, almost the big impact on Facebook or Twitter is stimulated by TV. So the role of TV is stimulating the people. And the role of Twitter or Facebook is to uh, extract the uh, opinion from users. But the, the missing piece of media is integrating users' opinion into the integrated uh, co common opinion as an organization. So if there are a missing piece of media exist, a TV uh, stimulates people. And social media uh, extract, uh, get, get the feedback from users. And the last piece of media merge their opinion and give feedback to the media. By that, the knowledge circulation uh, can be created. So what do you think about this idea? Okay, great. Final question, yes. Interesting question. <laughs> uh, my question about is about education. Uh, you all talked about the public empowerment and uh, but maybe it's kind of over, um, it, it's an like excess expectation, because um, Professor Murai talked about digital divide. I think it's more like a social media divide, because my parents didn't uh, even know how to tweet, or, or they don't uh, 
our access to that uh, information. So my question is, um, is um, social media liter uh, lit literacy can be um, teached or should be teached, um, or people would pick up uh, um, eventually? Should we teach the literacy, uh, or you can just wait and see how people would um, <coughs> would uh, get to understand the system. Okay, great. So I think we have a set of questions. What I'm going to ask, we have five more minutes. What I'm going to ask each of you to do is maybe address the question that's pertinent to you with, within the context that you want to summarize in, uh, in about a minute each, if you could do that. Peter, if you could yeah, start. Yep. So we just go, come down this way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <coughs> I'd like to cover Mr. Hotlink. Sorry, I didn't catch your, your name. Hotlink, the missing link, uh, and the education question. Um, basically, um, in my opinion, the, uh, the missing link to that is um, there's a lot of information out there, a lot of unreliable, un unchecked, unfact-checked information out there, opinion. Um, what is missing, especially in, in our, our space, and that's mainly because we can't afford to pay the, uh, the great journalists that are out there. Um, is analysis of all the information and really good, strong opinion because I think that um, basically people don't really read anymore. <laughs> and you know they'll, they'll read a tweet and then click off to the next thing, but they don't really have the time to go through all of the info that's out there and consider all the facts and then actual facts um, and then form an opinion. So I think, especially for, for my, um, our users, um, what we see is that people are craving great analysis and an opinion so they can then start forming their own opinions about all the stuff that's happening in the world. And, and with 3.11, um, I think that was, the big, that was definitely the big void, uh, especially in the English um, media that are in the, in the wire reports and, uh, and what we were receiving to publish to our users. And it also seemed to be um, absent in the Japanese media. And I'll, uh, to address the, the education piece, I, you mentioned he had an odd, uh, interesting question. I think your question is going to be an odd question 10 years from now because everybody is growing up. Uh, you know, the average age of my company is 31, and we're, we're old farts. <laughs> and I'm worried as the, as the, uh, as the CEO. I, I need to hire young blood who have who've grown up um, gaming and... Um, and Twittering and Facebooking. So um, I think, you know, in the future that'll be a, a, a very odd question. Everyone just knows it. But for the, for the current, uh, if it's relevant to you, for, for example, for your parents, if, if it's relevant, if you're communicating with them via Facebook, then they should definitely try to um, learn. But if it's irrelevant to their daily life, then... I, if I never look at a computer again, I'll, I'll be happy. I run an internet company, <laughs> to be honest. Oh, I see, yeah. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. great, Ross. Um, I haven't run the data, but I'm pretty sure that if I did, um, over the past five to six years, you would see a huge increase in the number of appearances of the Japanese words setsume sekinim, driving to your point. I think both in Japan and in other places of the world, perhaps Japan is a little bit slower and a little bit more reluctant. Uh, we are seeing a new age of accountability that is being driven by um, what we have termed here the new media, the digital age. Um, and the best defense for a company really is, as I said before, is to embrace that complexity. Uh, we have a huge explosion in the number of media channels available now. Um, we have the traditional media. Coming to your question, we have the hybrid media. Um, you made the point earlier that you pull in news feeds which is the traditional media, 
but you also have people making comments, which is social media, so that's a hybrid media. And we are seeing that also beginning to emerge in Japan, um, that sort of hybrid media. And you have the social media and you have your own media. Um, an explosion of channels, people can share information immediately. The speed and the interconnectivity is much greater than it was um, before. So people need, are getting used to the fast fix of news. They can access it across four different platforms. They, they have their, their tablets, they have their smartphones, their PCs, their TVs. Um, and so coming to your point, TV drives it because TV is a fast fix. Visual information is much quicker than sitting down and reading text. And if you actually look at the way information is shared on the web, a huge amount, percentage of that content that is being shared these days is video content or pictures, not text content. Um, so we are seeing this huge explosion of channels, of interconnectivity, um, of the way people can, the platforms that people can access this information, but at the same time, we still have a limitation of 24 hours a day and limited intention to be able to consume that media. And I think that's a new dynamic that we're all going to have to start getting used to. Um, and perhaps the way to do that is, is include that in an education. Okay, okay, nice time. Okay, um, RFC 822. Do you know about that? RFC 822 is your standard uh, to describe the email. And uh, the original uh, standard uh, definition was uh, use English ASCII for the email. You know, that was the original definition. So uh, we couldn't use a different language than the English uh, on the email. And uh, therefore, then, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of Japanese uh, um, industries and the tech, uh, engineers are working on that. And uh, if uh, you notice that Twitter, what, what is the uh, character limit of Twitter? 140. 140, okay. 140 English characters versus 140 Japanese characters, okay? This is totally different, okay? Different semantics can be tweet on the Twitter messages. So uh, you, you notice? And uh, then uh, we, can, we can tell a story on 140 characters uh, in the Japanese, but not using the English alphabet, okay? So this is a totally different way of, uh, you know, each independent culture, languages, and, uh, you know, have a different way of uh, media. Uh, usage of a media. Okay, TV questions, you ask me, you ask us a TV, uh, you know, usage, I mean, connecting with the internet, for example. Um, TV, uh, the, the, the advert, advertisement income business in the UK uh, for the internet exceeded the TV now. You know, the, that this is a business. But the, in Japan, you know, it's a twice as much in this country. So the, that's the reason why the Japanese uh, impacted from TV rather than, the, rather than the internet messages or social media in this country. So this is a characteristic. I'm not telling that it's, this is advanced or, or the slow or whatever. This is a culture. And uh, then, you know, so it's really um, important that the, the, uh, you know, the respecting the language, cultures, and uh, other things in order to uh, uh, talking about the media. And uh, then it's really important that, the, yes, internet is a global space. And then the internet, Twitter can travel around the world. But the, please know that the language is used on the Twitter, contents of the Twitter. Uh, you know, variety of languages in there and the variety of uh, um, the, the culture in there. So, so as the education. So we really have to be very careful that the matching with uh, our kids and uh, you know, how they grown up and how they learn and uh, which language they, they're going to use. And uh, then you know, we, we really need to um, watch that kind of a situation to introduce the media to the society. So that's what we've been. Great, thank you. Nick, final words. I have, every, I have every confidence that the next generation is going to pick up all this technology at high speed, does it anyway, whether they're rich or poor. If you go to India, if you go to Africa and see the take up of the, and the ability uh, to, to pick up the technology and to use it, it's remarkable. Uh, in the transit lounge at Seoul Airport last night, I was amazed. There were three kids telling their mother how to operate the equipment. You know, they knew at the age of six or seven how to do it better than she did. Um, which I think is indicative of just how profound this change is. 
Let's remember one thing about, uh, and I have to say this as, an, as part of an organization where we have to mediate, we have to authenticate, and we have to be very careful. Uh, when you go to a bar and you have a beer and you gossip, you don't have to mediate and authenticate what your mates tell you. Um, and Twitter is now a text form of gossip in many ways, and we have to look at it in those, in those terms and they, therefore be quite suspicious. If someone picks up the phone to you and says, have you heard... Do you believe them, or do you just wait and say, I'm going to check that out? So let's not be too high-minded about all this. We've got to find new filtering mechanisms for something we've done, always done. Did I understand your question correctly, the best defense for a company? Is that what you said? Yeah, I don't think you should see this as, as an attack on a company. Uh, this is not a threat, what we're talking about. This is a new opportunity. And if you see it, see it as a defense where you've got to put, put up defenses, you've got to reconfigure so that you are, you, everyone at every level, from the chief executive and the chairman right down to the equivalent of a private in the army, understands precisely what is changing. That they don't leak everything, much as I'd like to get leaks. They don't immediately put it on YouTube, 48 hours of material for every minute of the day now is being posted on YouTube. Uh, they've got to understand there are certain disciplines as part of company discipline, but it should not be seen as a threat. It should be seen as an opportunity where you can project a company, and particularly in times of crisis, where, of course, no company ever faces a crisis, but a time of crisis and real pressure, which hits you at left field, right field, and every field possible, and you're simply not prepared for it. That's why I say, right as I did at the beginning, it's about behavior and it's about mindsets. And most are not even prepared to get to first base and accept there's something there. As I often say, the most elusive, I'll say it again, the most obvious is actually the most elusive in this new environment. Great. Uh, thank you so much. There's a question to you now. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll just, so let me just try to. But there is a question to you. Okay. So, so 90 seconds just to, just to close. So I want to get you out. Um, on your question, I, I think the most um, inspiring thing that I saw during the earthquake uh, was actually people requesting help on Twitter uh, and solutions coming from users. So there was a lot of uh, hashtag called JJ help me, Japan Jishin, like earthquake help me, of people who were stranded uh, in areas where the government still wasn't there minutes after the tsunami. And, uh, and a lot of people used, just geotagged them and pulled them up into a map. And a lot of people went to actually help those uh, people. There, were, there was a hashtag for people who were pregnant who were, uh, had to sort of get medical help guidance. The medical society, the maternal society, actually used those hashtags to get doctors to tweet you know, solutions to them way before the infrastructure was set up. So I, I do think you know, that's a very different kind of engagement. I, I think there was a lot of distrust of uh, the government, but people saw that if there were issues they could address. A lot of people were willing to come forward in a direct way, which I thought was very heart, you know, heartening and also hopeful about the future, because I think in a crisis situation, you can't really, you, you do want to rely on the government, but there's a lot people can do, and there's a direct way to make that happen. So I'll just mention that example. I'm just going to end up with like three words that I really took away uh, from this. One was uh, this whole notion of uh, public information space. And I think we, we tend to discuss something like that, but what we imagine is very, very different. And I think uh, our commentators touched on the very different nature of how public information space is now created and consumed and analyzed, uh, which I think is terribly important. The other uh, word uh, I took away was new accountability. And I think we're seeing an Olympus example being the most recent in Japan, uh, but uh, this mindset and behavior really not adapting to the new accountability that's needed. And, and I think the speed with which executives and government ministers get kicked out these days, uh, when they don't meet that new accountability, is so fast and so intense. Uh, and I just mentioned one number for tweets. You know, a very trending topic uh, in, a, in, a, in a Twitter today is about 5,000 tweets per second. So that's an incredibly intense level of emotion and words that's flowing at you. So Olympus, at one point, was hitting several tweets per second. Uh, in terms of well, how people are feeling. So that's a kind of movement that you need to be moving extremely fast for with a very, very specific uh, set of information that you want to get out there that, that these companies were leaving, hanging around for days and weeks, uh, and it took them no time to get sort of swept away. 
Uh, and, but the last word that I really took away uh, was uh, this notion of engagement uh, as opposed to like protecting. How, how do you engage? And I think it's a very practical thing that all of us probably will be walking away from today. Uh, you know, it's one thing to get the mindset. It's another, you know, it's, it's another thing to sort of leave away the defense mechanism. But how practically to start engaging uh, is a huge issue uh, for many people. Uh, and we're not set up that way typically. And Ross, I'm sure, can provide a lot of services to you to help do that. But I think you know, individually, all of us are in a position where this is a new reality. And I think it's more about you know, what we can we do today, tomorrow, because it's, it's already amongst us. But thank you, the, uh, the panelists, for sharing that worldview with us. And thank you, uh, you know, the listeners, for asking all the questions. Thank you.